Welcome to this episode of Horrific History and Hauntings. I'm Beth. And I'm Remy. We're your hosts, here to talk about the stories that the history books ignore. From horrific epidemics and ghostly hauntings to the catastrophes and tragic events that have sickened humanity. Okay, what are we talking about today, Beth? You keep mentioning that we need more haunted-related episodes. So today I will be telling you a little bit about the hauntings and legends of Myrtle's Plantation in Louisiana. I like Louisiana. Yeah, I do too. I'm going to give my mother a shout out for this because she handed me a folder full of hauntings and ghost stories that she had printed off years ago. And I found this information in one of the packets in that folder. I told her to bring it down. She said, that's mine. And I said, I think Beth would like it more. Well, she's going to get it back. Like the second one in the whole stack was the Bell Witch. The Myrtle Plantation is located in St. Francisville, Louisiana. It's considered one of America's most haunted houses. I've heard of it. It was built in 1796 by David Bradford. That's a nice name. Mm -hmm. Since before being built, it was said to have been the site of at least 10 murders. That also sounds about right, too. That is wrong. It is false. That is a lie. They wanted to add a zero in the front of the one. There's only one known murder that occurred in the house. So much for all those hauntings. Mm. Now, a little bit about David Bradford. He was born in America to Irish immigrants, and he was one of five children. He was a successful attorney, businessman, deputy attorney general for Washington County, Pennsylvania. I didn't know they had one, too. They had one what? I mean, there's so many Washington counties around. Oh, yes. In 1785, he married Elizabeth Porter and started a family. And the family and his business grew until about 1794. Because in October of 1794, David Bradford was forced to flee his home, leaving his family behind. The reason for this was because he was involved in the Whiskey Rebellion. I don't have a clue what that is. Oh, that's a shame, because I also wrote, hoping that you know what Whiskey Rebellion is, because I didn't have time to look it up. I have heard of it, but I have no idea. I bet it was a rebellion. Really? Yeah. Was it? We could be wrong. It could have been some sort of wild party. I didn't have time to look up for it. Or I didn't have time to look it up. The legend is he had a price placed on his head for the, his role in the Whiskey Rebellion. I can see if it was a real rebellion that it would be reasonable. And not the rebellion, but perhaps the uh, bounty. I've heard of the Whiskey Rebellion, but I cannot remember what it is. Mm-mm. Bradford first went to Pittsburgh, and then he traveled down the Ohio River to the Mississippi. Eventually, he settled near Bayou Sarah, which is now St. Francisville, Louisiana. I like St. Francisville's name better. Yes, me too. In 1796, he purchased 600 acres of land, and a year later, he built a modest eight-room home, and then he called it Laurel Grove. That's a nice name, too. A lot of good names in Louisiana. There are. There's more to come, too. He lived there until about 1799 which is when he received a pardon for his role in the Whiskey Rebellion from President John Adams. Must have been pretty serious. I guess so, if they put a I mean, price on his head. the president had to pardon him. <laughs> After receiving the pardon, he returned to Pennsylvania to bring his wife and five kids back to Louisiana with him. While in Bayou Sarah, Bradford sometimes took in students who wanted to study law. One of his students, named Clark Woodruff, who earned his law degree, also married David's daughter, Sarah Mathilda. How'd that name come along? I think it's a middle name. Oh. <laughs> because it's like everybody's she's not name the only is different. one that has that. So I think it's a middle name. <laughs> who decides they want to study law from someone who is wanted by the law for a rebellion? Was wanted. No longer wanted. Yeah. Apparently, Clark Woodruff. Mm, that name is okay. <laughs> A little bit about Clark Woodroof. He was born August 1791 in Litchfield County, Connecticut, and he left Connecticut at age 19, arrived in Bayou Bayou Sarah in 1810. After the end of the War of 1812, Woodroof began studying law with David Bradford. November 19, 1817 is when he married Sarah Mathilda, David's daughter. I like the previous county. He's from in Connecticut. Litchfield? Mm -hmm. I mean, I like liches, and I can only imagine a whole field of liches. What's a lich? The strongest undead in D&D. Oh. They're basically undead wizards. That doesn't sound pleasant. Um, You could say that uh, Voldemort is something of a lich, because he... I don't want a field of Voldemort. Because you, you, you have to take your soul out and stub it in some sort of item. They call it a phylactery, whatever you store your soul in. 
if you get killed and your body gets destroyed somehow, somewhat, it's hard to do because you're such That's a why strong. That's it keeps coming back. It reforms from that. Your soul goes back to the item and a new body pops in and you, you can hide it anywhere and your soul just automatically goes there and builds a new body and you're an immortal lich until they destroy that phylactery. Is that why Michael Myers keeps coming back? He's probably a lich, but yeah, Lichfield. I don't know where we got the word lich from. Woodroof managed Laurel Grove for Elizabeth, his mother-in-law, after the death of David Bradford. He planted about 650 acres of indigo and cotton. And before it said 600, that David bought 600, so I'm guessing he bought more. Mm -hmm. At least 50 acres. Yeah. He and Sarah had three children, Cornelia Gale, James, and Mary Octavia. That's the name I like. I like Cornelia. Um, Cornelia is good, too. But I like Octavia. And James is just sad and boring. <laughs> it is. When you have siblings such as... Not even a middle as name, it's just Octa- James. Yeah, when you have like Octavia and Cornelia, and then this is James. <laughs> oh, poor James. July 21st, 1823, Sarah died of yellow fever. How unfortunate. Yes. With help from Elizabeth, he continued to care for his children and manage the plantation. July 15th, 1824, Woodroof's son, James, died from yellow fever as well. It just seems to be going around. It was that time that it had hit that area. I mean, July and then next July. (laughs) Oh, no. Poor guy. September of the same year, Cornelia Gale also died from the same way her brother and her mother perished. Eventually, Woodroof purchased Laurel Grove from his mother-in-law who was now elderly and, by this time, happy to sell it to him. I mean, yeah, it seems cursed. (laughs) This is cursed. Take it. But she continued to live there with him and her granddaughter, Octavia. Well, at least one of the coolest names survived. She died in 1830. Okay, I mean, that's still a good period of time. It is. After she died, Woodroof turned his attention to practicing law and less on the farming He and Octavia left Laurel Grove under the management of a caretaker and moved away. I mean, you're leaving the graves of your family behind. Yeah. January 1st, 1834, Woodroof sold Laurel Grove to Rufin Gray Sterling. What's up with these names? I want to say it's Rufin, not Ruffin. Ruffin sounds horrible. How do you spell it? R-U-F-F-I-N. It's Ruffin. I would say Ruffin. I say that. I would say, hey, Ruffin. (laughs) (laughs) By this time, Woodroof had changed the spelling of his name to Woodruff. Roof, roof. Well, it it might still be Woodroof, because it's a U, but I'm going to say Woodruff, because that's what I think dog, ruff, ruff. Yeah. I don't know. (sighs) He was now living on Rampart Street in New Orleans. Rampart Rampart Street. Rampart. Rampart. Rampart, like a rampart. Part of a castle or something. I don't know. I've heard of it. Some sort of history channel thing. A rampart. You've heard of a rampart. I'm pretty sure it's part of a castle. But I know I've heard rampart, not rampart. Well, like I said, I didn't have time to search things this time. He had been elected the president of public works for the city. And Octavia was sent to finishing school in New Haven, Connecticut. In 1836, she returned to live with her father. And two years later, she married Colonel Lorenzo Augustus. I don't know how to say his last name, but. Bescon, Besancon, B-E-S-A-N-C-O-N. Besancon? I guess, I don't know. I... He sounds Spanish. His, uh... his name is Colonel Lorenzo Augustus. It's going to be Colonel. She moved to his plantation called Oak Lawn, five miles north of New Orleans. And at 60 years old, Woodruff retired and moved to Oak Lawn to live with Octavia and her husband. The golden years have come at last. November 25th, 1851, he died and was buried in Girod Street Cemetery, G-I-R-O-D. I I don't know. Sounds nice. (laughs) Girod. I'm going with Girod. (laughs) Girod. And a side note about this cemetery is it fell into disrepair and was abandoned eventually. And in the 1960s, the city was hoping to renovate this part of the city and sent notice to families that the cemetery was going to be moved to Canal Street. The unclaimed bodies were placed in large drums and buried in a mass grave under the Hope Mausoleum. Clark was one of those unclaimed. The old cemetery was once located under what is now the present-day site of the Superdome. 
I keep thinking of Katrina when I think of that. Yeah. All the footage of people stuffed in there. We, a couple episodes ago, two or three episodes ago, we had a bunch of people shoved in barrels. Mm-hmm. We did. Yeah. I don't think it was for the same reasons. It was less respectful this time, I believe. Yeah, a little bit. Another reason to go cremation. They couldn't move you unless they took all the topsoil. By this time, the Sterlings had become the owners of the plantation. And they were a very wealthy family. They owned several plantations on both sides of the Mississippi River. January 1st, Rufin Sterling and his wife, Mary Catherine Cobb, took over the house, (laughs) buildings, land, and all of the slaves that had been sold to them from Woodroof. Woodruff, whatever his name is. The Sterlings were well thought of in the community. They wanted a house to match their social status, and they decided to remodel Laurel Grove. They added the broad central hallway, the entire southern section. The walls of the original house were removed and repositioned to create four large rooms. These rooms were used as identical ladies' and gentlemen's parlors, a formal dining room, and a game room. Elaborate plaster cornices were created for many of the rooms, made from a mixture of clay, Spanish moss, and cattle hair. Outside of the house, Sterling added a 107-foot-long front gallery, supported by cast iron supports, posts, and railings. The original roof of the house had to be extended, and the completed project nearly doubled the size, if not more, of David Bradford's original home. The name of the plantation was changed to Myrtles at this point. I like the name better. July 17, 1854, four years after completing the project, Sterling died of consumption. That's another popular way to go back then. Yeah. yeah. This left Mary Cobb, his wife, to manage all of their farms, and she did it well, single-handedly, for many years. She was considered a remarkable woman, and they said that she had the mind of a businessman. She couldn't just have the mind of a strong businesswoman. Only four of nine of Sterling's children lived to be old enough to marry. The oldest son, Lewis, died the same year as his father. His daughter, Sarah, Mulford's husband, was murdered after the Civil War on the front porch of the house. During the Civil War, many of the family's personal belongings were looted or destroyed by soldiers. Sounds about right. Their wealth was ultimately worthless due to it being in Confederate currency. Mary Cobb invested heavily in sugar plantations that were ravaged by the war. Eventually, she lost all of the properties besides the Myrtles. William Drew Winter and Sarah were married on June 3, 1852. They had six children, Mary, Sarah, Kate, who died from typhoid at the age of three, Rufin, William, and Francis. A lot of those Rufins. Yeah. December 1867, William was bankrupt. That didn't go well. No. April 15, 1968, the Myrtles Plantation was sold by the U.S. Marshals to the New York Warehouse and Security Company. Never heard of that. Sounds kind of cool. Me neither. (laughs) Are we specialize in warehouses and security? Which one do you need? We have a package for both. We will guard your warehouse that we sell you. Two years later, on April 23rd, the property was sold back to Mrs. Sarah M. Winter. January 26, 1871, Winter was in the gentleman's parlor teaching a Sunday school lesson. Someone approached the house on horseback and called him to saying that they had some business with him. So he went out onto the side gallery of the house and was shot by the man. Nobody knows who he was. They believe that a man named E.S. Weber was the one who shot him. And he was supposed to go to trial, but there's no records of if he did or not. Winter collapsed and died on the porch. I mean, he was shot. Yes. And Sarah never remarried. She was heartbroken, and she died at age 44 in April 1878. wonder what the cause of death was. Heartbreak. I don't know. Probably typhoid. After the death of Mary Cobb Sterling in August 1880, the Myrtles was purchased by one of her sons, Stephen Sterling, who bought out one of his brothers. March 1886... Some say that Stephen lost the plantation in a game of chance, but it's more likely there was too much debt in the place for him to hold on to it. So he sold it to Oren D. Brooks, O-R-A-N. I like that name too. January 1889, after many transfers, the Myrtles Plantation was bought by Harrison Milton Williams. Milton. Harrison Milton Williams was a widower who brought his young son and second wife, Fanny Linton Harrelson to the house in 1891. Let's go, Fanny. We're moving south. I thought it was Franny, and I thought they made a typo, but later on, they still say Fanny. So Come on, Fanny. (laughs) 
The names. Oh my goodness, the names. It's horrible. If we have any listeners with these names, we're sorry. And if there's uh, any rare chance someone listening who's related to these people, we're also sorry. You got to admit the name Fanny is funny. Eventually, the family grew to have seven children. When he was 15 years old, he began service in the Civil War and was injured. He planted cotton to keep the myrtles going during the hard times after the Civil War. And the Williams's oldest son, Harry, was gathering some stray cattle and fell into the Mississippi during a storm one day and drowned. That's unfortunate. It is. There's a lot of death early on back then. Yeah. We do have a local family who has a reputation for their children getting killed farming as well. Tractors tipping over and killing them and drowning them and everything. Mm. Down there on the river. Yep. You heard about that now you think about it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but a bunch of them died off. It's a wonder any of them survived. <laughs> Obviously, they were heartbroken, so Harrison and Fanny had their son, Sergey Williams, take over the management of the property. Sergey married a local girl named Jessie Folks, and he provided a home at the Myrtles for his spinster sister and maiden aunt Katie. I have a spinster sister. I'm not a spinster. <laughs> <laughs> Unwed. I'm engaged. 20, what is it, 27 years old? I'm 29 now, 29 thank you very years. much. The womb is going to shrivel. Well, good. <laughs> Let it. Let it shrivel. You best put those birthing <laughs> gifts to use, lest the womb withers. <laughs> <What is it? laughs> I love Johnny Depp. He's the best. <laughs> By the 1950s, property surrounding the house had been divided among the Williams heirs. The house was sold to to Marjorie Munson, an Oklahoma widow. And at this point was when the ghost stories of the house began. What is up with these people coming from odd places to buy this house? I don't know. I mean, it that's is. a long way it to is. buy. Like, I'm going to buy that over there. Usually, if you're uh, going to be fair, I would much rather be in Louisiana as well. I mean, this is the 50s, right? Uh, the 50s, yes. This okay. point the 50s. Okay. Well, I mean, it was even weirder when it was like way back then. Like 18 something and you buy a place you've probably never seen. You just send some solicitor to do that. And that's how you end up with Dracula in your city. That's what Renfield was. A solicitor sent to Mm -hmm. sign the paperwork for the manor. (laughs) I'm a solicitor for Louisiana. Yeah, there's just weird places to travel from. Usually if you're going to do that and you have the money, you're just going to have somebody build you a place while you're there. Maybe they didn't feel like putting that much effort into it. I mean, it's a massive place. The Sterlings did. They remodeled. They might as well just tore the house down and built a new one. Yeah. Yes. Marjorie Munson. That's when the ghost stories began. Munson. Strange things were happening in the house. So she started asking around, and this is how some of the stories, that's what people told her. I mean, they didn't have to be murdered to be ghosts. A lot of people no. died. Mm-hmm. So, Like the yellow fever. And whatever the other one was. What was it? Gonorrhea? Consumption. Consumption. And, <laughs> well, no, what was typhoid? Mm-hmm. Kids' names was Mary. And then you said something about typhoid. I'm like, oh, typhoid Mary. No, it was the wrong child. Oh, well, that's sad. No, it's probably good. Typhoid Mary spread that stuff to everybody. <laughs> the ghost Chloe is the most popular at known at the Myrtles Plantation. And a little bit about Chloe is... She's dead. <laughs> we'll get into it. Here's how the story is supposed to go, but you'll see that there are some errors. Discrepancies. 1817... Sarah Mathilda married Clark Woodruff and had given birth to two daughters. It's said that while she was pregnant with her third child, Woodruff began an intimate relationship with one of the slaves who's named Chloe. Oh. She was a household servant and she hated being forced to give in to Woodruff, everybody said, but realized if she didn't give in, she would be put to work in the fields. Woodruff eventually grew tired of Chloe and began to carry on with another girl. So the story goes. And so Chloe feared she would be sent to the fields. She began eavesdropping on the Woodruff family's private conversations. One day he caught her eavesdropping and to teach her a lesson ordered that one of her ears be cut off, which is where she's supposed to start wearing the green turban around her head to hide the scar. A bonnet? Some say turban, some say bonnet. Um. I think hairdress, hairdress, maybe another word used. I'm not familiar, so I don't know. take your word for it. I don't wear bonnets. Me neither. It's said that Chloe put a small amount of poison into a birthday cake made for Woodruff's oldest daughter. I have heard of this. Mm-hmm. It's a very popular one. 
It's unclear if this was only for revenge or just to make them sick so she could prove herself by nursing them back to health. She put a handful of crushed O-L-E-A-N-D-E-R flowers. Oleander. Uh, Oleander? Oleander. Oleander. Yes, Oleander. What's an Oleander? I don't know. I've heard of, maybe I'm thinking of Coleander. I don't know. She put a handful of that in with the flour and sugar that went into the cake. Sarah and the two children ate a piece of cake, but Woodruff did not. By the end of the day, they were sick. In a matter of hours, even with Chloe tending to them all, they, all three, were dead. It's said that the other slaves were afraid their owner would punish them as well, so they dragged Chloe from her room and hanged her from a nearby tree. Later, her body was cut down and thrown into the river, weighed down with rocks. Woodruff closed off the dining room where the party was held and never allowed it to be used again during his life. The room is now called the game room. Fun and games in the murder room. Chloe's ghost has been reported at the Myrtles since her death. A past owner photographed her by accident. The plantation still sells postcards with this image of what is said to be Chloe standing between two of the buildings. You would also be upset if you were the kids. They could be haunting it too. She has been seen often in her green turban, wandering around at night. Sometimes cries of children can be heard when she is seen. Well, yes, she's a murderess. She was treated badly and turned into a murderess. (laughs) Yes, tragic all around. While sleeping, some have reported waking up to her face peering at them from the side of the bed. Oh, that'd be that, eerie. Yeah. But like I said, this story has errors. If you remember the history of the family that I said before, there's no evidence to prove that Woodruff had an affair or had an ear cut off of one of his slaves. Historical records show that Sarah Mathilda was not murdered. She died from yellow fever. That's what records say. They could have pretty much done whatever they wanted to and not had to care about reporting it, I guess. I don't know. Her children were one son and one daughter, not two daughters. And they died more than a year after her death. It wasn't by food poisoning either. Not poisoned by food. They were not poisoned in general. No. And at this time that this story was said to happen, Sarah would have been pregnant with Octavia at this point. Octavia lived with her father and lived to an old age. She was not. She was born. Sarah would have died while she was pregnant. So that doesn't Uh, make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Woodruff was not murdered, which this story also says. Later on, I didn't add it in that part, but it also says he was later murdered. He died in 1851 at his daughter and son-in-law's plantation. No, that's kind of hard to deny. Yeah. I don't know. I have to say no proof, but it sounds very definite. (laughs) There is no proof that Chloe even existed and that some stories say it was Cleo and not Chloe, but there's still no proof of either. There may have been someone like that that existed. But no Chloe, no Cleo. Yeah. No records anyway. The theory of how the story got started was in 1950s, the wealthy widow Marjorie, who owned the Myrtles, began to notice strange things occurring in the house. She asked around according to local stories, and that's when the legend of Chloe began. The granddaughter of Harrison and Fanny Williams said her aunts used to talk about a ghost of an old woman who wore a green bonnet who's haunted the Myrtles. It said old woman. Chloe was supposed to be young. As time went on, like it's everything of, else, it's a game of telephone. The story began to grow and change. The Myrtles changed hands several more times, and in the 1970s, it was restored again under the ownership of Arlen Deese and Mr. and Mrs. Robert F. Ward. Those names are less exciting. <laughs> yes. Well, we're getting later on in time, so everything become dull. Yep. No more fannies. <laughs> Darn. The story began to grow even more. It started showing up in magazines, newspapers, things like that. And this is about the time it began to include the poison and murders and severed ear part. It's just a flight of fancy. James and Francis Kermine Myers purchased the Myrtles. And as time went on, TVs, books, the story was going everywhere. Blown out of proportion. Yeah. And it was changing even more. With Sarah and her daughters and Chloe still part of the story, it is now said that as many as six others were killed in the house. One being Louis Lewis, however you said to pronounce that. Louis Lewis. (laughs) Rufin Gray Sterling's oldest son, who was claimed to have been stabbed to death in the home over a gambling debt. Records show he died of... In October 1854, due to yellow fever, though. And this is why research for this kind of stuff is so difficult, 
because people want to blow these stories out of proportion. And it's hard enough to find actual records and dates. And you have to sift through the internet and try to find. It is so hard. Why can't you just stick to the truth? It's less profitable. Other ghost stories and legends at the Myrtles Plantation would be three Union soldiers were said to be killed in the house as well. It said that they broke in and attempted to dilute the place, according to the story. They broke in and attempted to dilute the place. They were said to be put to death in the gentleman's parlor, leaving bloodstains that couldn't be wiped away by a maid when the Myrtles was an inn, which this is said to have only lasted a month or so, and then the stain never returned. There's no records of this that can be found, and even surviving relatives say that it's not true. Why would they kill them in the parlor in the first place if they had them captured to be put to death? Yeah, take them outside. Why would they do that? And where in the world did that woman... I don't know about, at, Maybe especially they got some... at this time, I don't know if they had stand your ground laws Back then, I think you just protect your property whenever. Back in the good old days. In 1927, another alleged murder... A caretaker in the house was killed during a robbery. Again, no records to prove this, but this could have come from when the brother of Fanny was living in a small house on the property and was killed while being robbed. Fanny, Fanny. that didn't even happen in the main house either, but that could have been where that came from. A lot of horror stories and creepy things pop up around old houses, especially pretty old houses with a legacy. You know the houses are full of tragedies because families lived in them and died in them forever, yeah. you know. So stories do get started. And if there isn't any, it's a good place to make up a story. In the information age, it comes harder now. William Drew Winter is the only verified murder in the house. And it was on the porch. Which also was changed throughout time. The story about him and what got changed was it was said Winter was lured out and shot that he staggered back into the house passed through the gentleman's parlor, then the lady's parlor, onto the staircase, and managed to make it up to the 17th step and died in his love's arms. I thought this was during a dinner party or something that this happened. A party? Uh, He was teaching Sunday school. He just went straight past class. They're like, well, there he goes. (laughs) And nobody bothered to assist him to his love's arms. Yeah. It's been reported that ghostly footsteps have been heard taking the same exact path he did when this was supposed to have happened and stopping on the 17th step. Interesting story. However, Winter was indeed murdered, but he fell immediately on the porch where he died. He didn't stagger that whole path that the story changed to. Okay. Well, that's kind of what we expected to (laughs) do. There's also a large mirror in the home, which is said to hold the spirits of some of those who have died there. Photographs of the mirror have developed with what looks to be handprints and sometimes many people inside of the glass. When the images appeared, it was said that the mirror was thoroughly cleaned, but that the prints could still be seen. So the owner replaced the glass, but the prints kept returning. Some have studied the mirror and suggested the handprints or the images resembling them could be on the wood behind the mirror and not the glass. and. Lights, such as camera flashes, could pass through the glass, still showing the marks on the wood. So this has happened enough to where it actually is being looked into, at least. That part, yeah. Our local Martha Washington Inn has a bloodstain that does not come up underneath, I believe, a table or a clock in the hallway. I think think they moved a clock over it because it wouldn't go away. I mean, I've seen bloodstains in our own carpet that don't go away. Yeah, but they've changed the carpet, I believe. Oh, we'll see there. I want to say they did. I was in it when I was a child, so I don't remember. I would like to do an episode on all of the ones around here. We should invite Dakota for the Martha one. Okay. Oh, yeah. He works there. Yeah. Not technically in the hotel part, but he works there. He works in the kitchen still. Yeah. So. I don't know. I always imagine haunted kitchens in hotels. <laughs> it seems like the staff would be the chattiest. <laughs> the conclusion about all of this is the stories have been exaggerated and they don't match the historical records that were found. That doesn't necessarily mean that supernatural or strange things were not going on in the Myrtle's plantation because something had to have happened for the stories to even start. Like Marjorie apparently witnessed some things that were strange. 
for her to go asking in the first place. That's true. But I'd like to think yeah. also that if she just went and asked people, and they're like, this lady from God only knows where. Oklahoma, is asking, I don't want to say. Is oh, where she this lady from. from Oklahoma is asking me questions about this place like I was there 200 years ago. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell her some stories about a family name I've heard. Or she could have been meeting complete strangers. I think my house is haunted. Tell me something that's happened here. And they're like, uh, okay, lady, let me tell you some stories. <laughs> we'll get her to move out real quick. And I got away with it, too, if it wasn't for you meddling kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, 1987, Frances Myers claimed to have encountered the ghost with the green turban while sleeping in one of the downstairs bedrooms. She was awakened by a woman wearing a green turban and a long dress. She claimed she was standing by the bedside with a candle that gave off a soft glow. She pulled the covers over her head, as I would too. And when she removed the covers, the woman had vanished. Except I'm not removing those covers for nothing. Somebody better come get me. (laughs) You need to get on out of here. I was never one of those people who hid my head under a blanket to stay safe. Not like for any long period of time. Shove her out of the way. Move, bitch. (laughs) Get out of the way and run away. (laughs) Our great aunt used to talk about seeing ghosts at the edge of her bed. I feel like there was lead or mercury in her water as well, though. There was a lot of iron in her water, and we did find some bottled mercury in the house. Like a whole five-pound bottle, it says right on the side, right next to a skull and crossbone. I never understood why someone would buy mercury. It's so heavy. Maybe it was a paperweight. That's what I've used it for. That's a, <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's, that's why it's at the house now, the same old bottle. Oh. I mean, you could throw it at somebody's head and do some It harm. was just stored in the kitchen cabinet. Just throw the whole bottle at somebody's head and you could do them some harm. It's so heavy. Buy the glass. Like you get your drinking glasses and here's your mercury in the same cabinet. That's where it was. (laughs) A five pound bottle of mercury. I picked it up and I was like, this is really mercury. It was so old. The littering was like rubbed off. I looked it up and like, should I report this or get rid of it or something? And nobody knows. Everybody seems to think. How do you dispose of something like that? Well, they say you should take it to a local college where they might find a use for it is about all you can do. So paperweight it is. That's a paperweight it is. Yeah. Okay. In the photos taken of the ghostly figure, it doesn't look like a young woman, which is like I said, Chloe's what's supposed to be young. The images show an older looking woman, such as the one described by the Williams's family. Though there was only one verified murder, there were several deaths from yellow fever alone. That took place in the house. So there is a possibility that some spooky stuff's going on there. Some people would be real salty about dying of yellow fever. Yeah. I probably would be. There's also reports of ghostly children playing in the rooms in the hallways. Two children, one small girl and a boy, which could be the Woodruff children who died from, not from poisoning, but yellow fever. A young girl with curly hair and wearing an ankle length dress has been seen outside the window of the game room like she's peeking in nosy it's reported that on the first floor the grand piano plays by itself sometimes throughout the night and when someone checks the room the music stops and it starts again as soon as they leave the room i would move the piano i couldn't be woke up in the middle of the night from that nonsense (laughs) a gate man who was supposed to greet people every day one day while he was at work a woman in an old-fashioned white dress walked through the gate and did not speak to him she walked up to the house and, without opening the door, vanished through it. He quit and never returned to the house. I don't know if I'd quit, but... I, I wouldn't quit over that. I'd be a little unnerved, I guess. Or I'd want to tell a story or risk losing my job. I'd be afraid to actually say anything. <laughs> you never know. I, I feel like they won't care. That's just more business for them if you more you tell. Yeah. And that's all I have for today. Well, now I've learned more about this place. I, I've never heard the other stories. I've always just heard the poisoning story. Yeah, it's nice to know. I mean, it's kind of disappointing. Well, maybe not disappointing because that's a terrible way for everybody to go out. Yes. Terrible things to happen. But nice to know the truth. At least what we know of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, at least what we know of it. We are part of a podcast network called Gruesome Gaming Group. We also have a Twitter <laughs> account for Gruesome Gaming Group. It's called Gruesome Gaming G. And you can find us there. Contact us there. Beth also has a way to contact her and follow her. Tell us that information, Beth. If you want to contact me for any ideas for future episodes or just simply have questions or I've messed up on something and you want to respectfully let me know so I can try to fix it in a future episode, please let me know at horrifichistory.hauntings at gmail.com. I do have a Pinterest and... Though I don't create too much, I just create a few advertisements with 
Everybody loves advertisements. Well, for the podcast, just a few. And I try to draw my own pictures when I do this, but sometimes I can't. But I do save a lot in my saved boards. Not my creations, but save a lot. Like the store. Not <laughs> <laughs> like the store. <laughs> Not like the store. But they have some interesting pictures and you can find some interesting information that I try to save about each of these topics. Yeah. Follow her there. Come to Gruesome Gaming it's, G on Twitter. It's horrific history and hauntings oh, yeah, as yeah. well. Also, Beth and I do another podcast called uh, Brother Knows Quest. It's a podcast where I bring down a tabletop role-playing game and I try to tell her about it and get her, tell her about the setting in the game and see if she would like to play it sometime. It's just a very short one episode per book introduction to a game system and a world that the game takes place in. If you like D and D or stuff like that, and a friend of mine, Dakota, and I have a podcast called Leveling Duo. It's where we talk about all the video games we've played throughout the years and try to talk about the ones we really enjoyed growing up with. Beth uh, was a guest not too long ago and done a Sims episode. Since Dakota and I don't play Sims, there'll be a link in the description below for all her the podcasts and somewhere on that page under the name of each podcast, you can go to the individual podcast website and follow them if you want to sample them or something like that. Thank you for listening. I've been Ramey. And I'm Beth. And this has been Horrific History and Hauntings. Bye-bye.